Got it. All right. Okay. Well, nice to finally sit down and meet you. Um, could you start just by saying your name, please, and where you are? Yeah, um, my name is Ato Kwame Nainkum. Um, most people know me as Kwame Nainkum. I am in Accra, Ghana. Okay. Yeah, West Africa. Wonderful. And the first big question is, who are you as a human being? And that can mm. be your values, qualities about yourself, the way you move in the world, whatever you'd like to share. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. Um, let's see. Let me go to the relational piece because that's it's, that's the first place I go to. I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a brother. Um, and uh, I'm a colleague of the Gestalt Africa. Um, in, well, right now it's a, it's a new platform, so it's not an organization necessarily, but um, we... Uh, and the way I relate in, and the way I exist in this world, if you ask me who I am, I go to these relational points because that's, that informs how I live my life. I, I, I live less in my head and more in my relationships. I'm working with my father. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a father to four wonderful children who give me life and joy. Um, I work with uh, wonderful uh, colleagues on the continent trying to give and and give an experience of gestalt to African leaders. So that's my go-to for who I am. And so you say that you are less in your head, more in relationship. Mm. What kind of values do you orient around in relationship, in the world? Yeah. Uh, the, the value that drives me um, particularly when I look at the relationships around me, is one of respect, of mutuality, of uh, um, of seeing the divine in the in the other, um, of uh, giving of myself in a way that makes not just me but the other person, uh, whether it's my father, my wife, my children, my colleagues that I work with. Um, become better every day um, in our interactions. And so uh, there's a little bit of sacredness that I hold for these uh, relationships uh, that I describe. Um, particularly for me, when I talk about my father, because he's been my friend, he's been my mentor, he's been my colleague for a number of years now. And um, that has, in my adult life, built me up to understand what it looks like to have somebody who's older, mature, and yet is able to receive from me such um, love. And I call it love because it's so di multidimensional. Um, I give him my my attention. I give him my care. I give him my um, com capacity and competencies and and, and everything that I can possibly give to uh, enable our relationship become better. Uh, and it's not just for what I gain from it, but what he also can get from it. So I, I see, and that's, and for me, let me say this, um, Heather, it's, the, 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 when I say I see the divine in the other, uh, that's anchored in how I live my life because I'm a Christian uh, and I believe in the, and it's not the Christianity that has been publicized or made public in a way that um, bastardizes or shames or destroys, but in the original intent uh, of it, of having God live in each of us in a way that makes each one of us sacred. And so that's that's the place I go to for, for my, my value of holding these relationships. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I... I have only met your father through this medium and in his interview, but he has a remarkable presence. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So those that's sort of what informs your values, where they come from. What would you say comes to mind as an experience, like a particular moment or a set of circumstances in your life that may have really shaped or changed who you are? The first one that I will mention um, is I was, I believe I was about 10 years old. I was in class five. Um, 
in primary school. And we were sitting around the breakfast table. My father had just traveled and come back from doing an international gestalt program. At the time, I didn't know that that was what it was. And he was exhausted and he was, um, he wept. He was, he was the burden of him being the first of his kind in the family to have the opportunity to have the access exposure to bring our families from uh, poverty, from not knowing to knowing, to give us the opportunity to go to school when his siblings hadn't got that opportunity. It was a huge burden on him and I remember him crying. And one of the, the reasons he shaped my life was because I cried with him and I asked him, I didn't understand why he was crying, but I felt for him. And I remember asking him, why is he crying? He said, you will understand someday. And for the first time in a long time, he walked me to school that morning. And so we had a conversation about how he's doing. He was just expressing how there was so much on him as a firstborn son. And I'm the firstborn son. So I felt in the same, if you will, the same shoe. Uh, although his was much bigger than it, uh, it's, it's for me right now. Um, and even now, as I remember, it, it makes me very emotional. But it was, a, it was a defining moment for me and how I relate to my father moving forward. Years on, um, I had been a stubborn teenager. Uh, he and I had a very difficult relationship during that period. And then he found me again and asked me to come with him to prepare for him for one of his workshops. Uh, it was, you know, the client had allowed him to bring a reporter and he decided I would reporter for him because I had just finished uh, middle school. Um, and uh, I remember he was doing something with the participants. Again, I didn't understand what was going on. I was just writing notes. People were crying. People were, and they would come to me and say, your father is an amazing guy. You know, what he's doing with us is so transformative. I was like, what is going on here? And I, was, I mean, imagine a young man sitting with all these mm -hmm. 30, 40 year old men and women, and they were all crying. And I, it, was, it was such an emotional experience for me. It shaped me. So I asked him again, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, this time I'll explain to you because now you're not young anymore. Mm -hmm. He said, this is the kind of work I do. I do gestalt um, with people. I, I help them to, to form holes. I help them to appreciate how they can embrace holism. And if you want to do this kind of work, just let me know. And I'll, I'll pay for you to go to school in that trajectory. And I said, yes, actually, I'm very curious. I'm very interested in doing this. So years on, uh, I went to the I International Gestalt and Organization and Leadership Development Program, and I became a Gestalt practitioner. That's... Those are the key moments in my life that have shaped me. Um, yeah. to be That's to interesting. Be. Going from the stubborn teenager who doesn't even know the person that you're angry at, right? Yeah. That's that. Wait a minute. What? Who are you? Uh -huh. I was finding myself. Um, I found that the reason I was having a difficult relationship later on, I realized when I was in my 20s, is that I wanted to be noticed by my father. I wanted to be seen and recognized by him. And at the time, he was very busy trying to work and build our future and get us so much. He was ne almost never present. Uh, so my rebellious um, nature came out in that way. Um, and then I found my purpose in life as a result. So it was actually a good thing. <laughs> so so what is your purpose in life? I love it when people say that they found this. I'm always really curious, like, what is it? I found my purpose of helping people to appreciate um, difference as something to embrace and not to um, destroy. I found my purpose in enabling uh, people that I work with, people that I live with, to understand themselves and understand others. Appreciate, if you will. Um, some of them have been successful. Um, if I think of my um, some of my clients, I think I've done some good work with some of them, and some so not successful. If I think of my wife as an example, I'm still working on that, um, helping her to appreciate what is and what could be uh, as um, 
not polar opposite, but an, an emergence, a, a journey. Uh, and it's still life, my lifelong work that I, I embrace. And, and you can see the big smile on my face as I say it. So mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not saddened by it. It's, it's no, it seems like you enjoy a bit of a challenge. Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> I'm up for it. Let's go. <laughs> uh, and how how is fatherhood for you? Fatherhood is humbling um <laughs> yeah. it is a, and, and, and do you and, have teenagers it, yet exactly exactly <laughs> <laughs> it's a humbling experience um and I, I you know i refer back to how i felt when i was a child and how and i try and, and the world is completely different Heather, since when i was a child because there were no cell phones in the time when i was a kid those you know life was completely different even as an african child uh, from than it is for my children now in the same context, uh, and so I'm being mindful of what do I need to know and do different from my father to be a better father than he was to them in the context that they find it, find themselves in. So an example would be um, when I was a child, there was nothing like play like take your kid to the playground. We just went out and played with other kids, and now you can't find kids just playing anywhere. You have to actually find other kids in the playground with, and have to be with other parents you know you have to actually be more mindful. You, you have to schedule appointments for them exactly <laughs> it, the world is completely strange um parenting is, is a whole another ball game now and so I've, i find myself having to and, and you know my kids are using phones i, I never had access to it like in those days letters were the thing and even that um mm -hmm. human contact was more the thing. I found myself, you know, having to buy a PS5 for my kids because they connect with their kids, other kids online to play. So there's the human contact piece is missing. It's, it's, it's so much has changed and I'm having to, I, I recognize that I need to be a different parent with mm -hmm. more awareness than my father probably was. Uh, mm -hmm. well, there's like, that, that quote around education about, you know, it's not going to work if we prepare them for a world that no longer exists. Exactly. The world is completely different, Heather. And, you know, even for me, uh, it's, it's it's not just a learning point. There's some things don't exist anywhere that I have to go and pick up and learn from. It, it's all emerging and I have to be conscious and 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 aware and um, empathetic and um, be with them and try and shape and guide and provide a container in some cases, because you never know what they're going to do with whatever you provide them. And just let them do what they think uh, will help them as kids to play and enjoy and, and have fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. So another question that I often ask is, you know, how have you come to understand and experience yourself within your gender or as a man or in masculinity? Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, that's a good question. Um, for me, <clears throat> Heather, the, 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 the continent... Uh, and, and I always bring this back to where I am because I live in, context is everything for me. So uh, in, on this continent, being a man is, is perceived as being the head. And yet, uh, culturally, the women are the ones who lead. Uh, if, you, if you will, on the, you know, below the water. It's seen as a patriarchal, patriarchal system or patriarchy is the thing that holds us and yet there's no king without a chief queen mother allowing that king to lead so in, even in my family my mother is a, a house um housewife you know she she doesn't work uh, formally and yet any decision that is made in my family whether it's even for my father whose mom died recently and we are doing the funeral arrangements, all the decisions she has to say, she lets, she gives the okay before it goes. Um, the same is true for my wife in my, my household. I'm trying to do a project. I'm trying to do something for the kids. It has to go to her to make a, get an approval. She has to agree. She may even add or make amendments to it. I have to agree. She has to finalize and then it's done. Mm -hmm. So it's not so, absolute leadership. It's, no, it's not. My, men in, in African contexts, at least to the best of my knowledge, don't lead by themselves. The women actually lead from behind. And it's a very powerful thing 
to to know. And if men who don't know this have often not led for long on this continent. Um, and so I hold my masculinity delicately um, because I know that it's I'm seen as the leader only superficially because uh, right underneath that is a woman who is dictating almost every step that I, every decision that I make has to be cross-checked and mm -hmm. validated by a woman. Mm -hmm. And that's the culture and the context that I come from. Mm. Yeah. And, and what about other contexts? What is it like being you, being uh, man, being who you are yeah. in, you know, when you cross oceans and fly around in the body that you live in? Oh, that's a, that's a very good one. Now, that's a different one because I'm uh, first a black man before a man. Um, so when I was in the U.S., I lived in the U.S. for about six years. Um, being a man and being a black man for that matter, I had to always watch, literally watch my back, quote unquote. If you act in a certain way, you are perceived in a certain way. So I was very conscious to be always form and find a way to conform find a way to stay in, in a way that I'm not um, spotlighted. Uh, I'm not the uh, perpetrator of some uh, things. So I'm, uh, in, in the US I found, and I was, my, I, was work, I was I studied and worked in the US for a bit. Uh, when I was in school, I recognized that I wouldn't do things that will put me in trouble. When I worked, I needed to make sure that I always paid my bills. I always have good credit score. You know, there are certain shoots and, and I became, a, as a result, an introject. So I was always conforming. And I think part of it is also because of my rebellious teenage years. I found that by the time I was in the U.S., when I was in my 20s, I needed to really make sure that I was not rebellious anymore. Um, I needed to really conform. I needed to do what was expected of me, whatever that looked like. Uh, sometimes I wouldn't even know what that looked like, but I needed to make sure that, okay, what do I need to do in this situation so that I'm not... Uh, sticking out like a, a sore thumb uh, or coming up for radical uh, or or to be hammered up. So I, I was such a conformist uh, up until I recognized from my Gestalt study that it's okay to be different. It's okay to be a man and be different. It's okay to be a black man and be different. Uh, it took me a couple of years to accept that uh, after having lived in the US where I wanted to really stay under the radar and be away from from trouble mm. yeah yeah I, I imagine also to be safe primarily to be safe but also um i recall i went to budapest and um we stepped out with a, um, some other colleagues of ours and i left my passport uh, in the hotel room and i recall seeing police who had just stopped over some immigrants uh, and we're checking their documents, and I felt frightened all of a sudden. Um, even though I hadn't done anything wrong, we're just walking by the roadside. And, you know, so it, it, it was not just safety, but it was something about survival. Um, and it was, this is a core, um, I guess, emotion. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling, but it took me a while. Um, and I recognized, actually, I don't need to feel unsafe. I don't need to feel like I'm, on the fight or flight, I can just be aware of what's happening and make different choices. Uh, and it took me Gestalt learning, Gestalt training uh, to come to this awareness and to this understanding. Hmm. Yeah. So now I find myself wanting to ask you what leadership is for you, because mm -hmm. I mean, making yourself as small as possible, as safe as possible, or mm -hmm. being in that, you know, trauma response reactive state, that's not leadership. Like, yeah. what, what balance do you have to find or how do you set yourself up to, to take or to understand a leadership position? Yeah, I, I'm, I've am i become a leader now, Heather, as a result of the Gestalt program, and I define it as this way. A leader is, or leadership, is a competence of providing a space for others to emerge, for others to do their work. And that's what I do in my in my work as a consultant, as an OD consultant now. I support organizations and people that I live and work with. And so it's a way of life for me now. It's not just the way of working. Um, I, I just facilitate and enable people to do what they want to do with awareness. Um, and the same is true for me. 
uh, in that I'm leading myself to become more aware. What am I aware of, even as I speak to you now? What tensions are happening within me? What emotions are bubbling up? Um, how do I use that um, to make different choices than I would if I was in uh, flight or fight mode or if I was in uh, feeling like I need to be as minimal as possible? Um, and that, that um, has helped me to uh, become more aware of my autopilot so that I don't act on what is only coming from my lizard brain, but I'm bringing my emotions and my thoughts and my being, my essence, more cognitively and making a choice about, I'm okay, I'm, a, I'm, I'm fine. This is what is, and I'm going to make a different choice instead of just you know trying to minimize myself or go, go the far opposite, which is also being rebellious. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I'm finding that leadership is helpful for me and for the people I work with. Just giving up the space for more awareness so that you can make more choices. Okay. So, I mean, professionally, but also personally, how would you say that you've come to understand power and privilege? The, the difference for me, um, and I, I make a distinction between power and privilege slightly, although um, theoretically I know that power uh, enables you to have privilege. But I, I in, in, you know, for me, there are people who are who have power, but don't have the privilege of being loved, of being, of being accepted, of being who they are supposed to be. So power doesn't necessarily give you, for me, the privilege of, of having uh, what power brings, which is access, influence, whatever. Um, there are people who are powerful and are very silly, and I wouldn't want to associate with them, or I don't want to um, have anything to do with them. Uh, and so where I find that power and privilege can be useful and where they inter the nexus between the two that can be beneficial is where power is enabled as a, uh, a place to, to support others to have privilege as well, to have access, to have influence, to have um, possibilities uh, and opportunities for resources or shared co-sharing of a vision. Um, the, the reason that I say that is because on, on you know I do a lot of work with ECOWAS and also uh, in my country with the different organizations. And one of the things we have found that is difficult is how leaders use their power to undermine and not to provide opportunities or privilege for others to get access to power. Um, and power is, you know, I like to think of power as not limited. I think power can be expanded to include others. And yet, oftentimes, you find that power uh, limits and power diminishes uh, when it's supposed to enable and supposed to uplift and supposed to support um, co-sharing of a joint vision uh, for things to be done uh, in a way that can, can be better than it is. We find that that is not the case often. And that's the joy of the work I've, I'm given, the burden, I pay, perhaps, if you will, I've been given of having to work with organizations that um, are in this dilemma. Yeah, I'm just, I'm thinking sort of like the, the power over versus sharing power with. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, that's the difficulty. Um, that we have in the world today, particularly in my context, as when people get power, it's not power with, it's power over. And to get that shift in that, that mindset shift requires a lot of work on what, what, what awareness do we need to have? Best, first of self, how am I aware of who I am? Um, and how am I aware of my power and how I use it, and that enables others mm -hmm. to join in this. Because it, the, the more powerful I can be is based on how more people can join in this power, uh, I guess, um, container, if you will. Because it's, it doesn't, my, I don't get less powerful if somebody gets more powerful. It, it, I just, it, it, it's, we, it's a sharing. And funny enough, um, my culture is, in, is supposed to be a collective African context 
typically are collective um, contexts. And yet, power becomes very individualistic. It's not shared. It's not given enough privilege to others to share in the vision, in the power, in a way that can elevate us together. Uh, and I don't know where we have gone missing with with that. And something is something is not aligned, and that's I guess the lifelong work that the stout practitioners like myself and others on the continent um, have the privilege and the duty to do. Mm. Yeah, I mean, speaking from a Mexican context as well, that's that's where I'm really interested in in how that the the concept of decolonizing can come in. Because these are not the natural power structures or the original power structures of most of the world. But right. this, this hierarchical, you know, this understanding yeah. of power, this understanding of, you know, collective individual dichotomy, yeah. it, it's very bound up in the colonial structures. It, 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 and it's, you know, there's something that has happened. And I don't know, I haven't studied history sufficiently to be able to inform this, but colonial rule perhaps has destroyed what I believe, perhaps there were wars before, perhaps there was always colonialism in in our own context, in our own way, there were always people who were going to kill or dominate others. Yet, I find that when in the, in, in, in my little history, knowledge of history, when colonialism happened, there was a destroying of this collectivist idea to centralizing power and centralizing um, I'm not going to go to race. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to um, those who have the access and influence and privilege over others. Uh, and it is a very horrible thing that happened. And the human race has de declined as a result of that. We see technology has elevated us. That's that's one part, which is fine. And I, I'm, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I think colonialism and new colonialism has really destroyed how much better we could have used technology to make us integrate some more sufficiently as a people. Yeah, I think generally humanity has not done well with the resources that we have. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It looks it looks to me that we we decided for some reason that some people should have more and others should not have sufficient. Mm -hmm. When in fact, um, the more all of us have, the more better we can all be. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know why that is not common knowledge. It's it's strange. Right. It's that common sense that is it's very rare. Yeah. It really is common sense. I, I, I don't know whether if I have one and I give you one, that I become less. How does that make me less? You have one, I have one. We are, we are okay. Everybody mm -hmm. else has. So for some reason, though, we find that actually I should have two and you have nothing. Mm -hmm. And that makes me better. And it actually, it doesn't. It makes, it makes you more less and more dependent on me. I become more responsible and that, that doesn't balance the equation at all. I think the world would be better served if those with power, if those with access and influence, those with possibilities can support and should support, have the duty actually to support others, to come up um, as well. That sounds radical and absolutely <laughs> logical at the same time. So At the same time, at the same yeah. time. Hmm. Okay. That's the world we live in. And, 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 and Heather, I, I, let me repeat this. It's a lifelong work. Mm -hmm. I believe that even beyond our lifetime, this will become still the thing to do. Um, because the more and more the world is moving towards um, having those with power hoard more over those who don't have. Well, and you use the word interject. And it's it's something that has to be unlearned before you know, mm -hmm. any kind of change can actually be implemented. And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, parents, we run into that. It's like, where did you learn this? Why do you mm -hmm. think like this? Oh, wait, mm -hmm. that's the mm -hmm. water that the, the kids swim in. That's where they are. Mm -hmm. This is their world. I try and teach my kids to know the difference between 
following the rules because it's necessary and at the same time having the freedom to explore and it's a very difficult place to work in um because i i've i tended to follow the rules too much and became an introject in that regard um that i should i should and don't do this and don't that doesn't create innovation i'm trying to give my kids the opportunity to be innovative and different and say yes you have to go to bed at eight because it's good for you you have to sleep a number of hours to to have um you know recover your energy and yet at the same time uh, i'm saying to them that it's okay to ask me as a as your father daddy why is this the way it is mm -hmm. not just okay, right so um, I'm, I'm, that's the fine balance that I'm trying to give to my kids. I didn't have that opportunity, so I'm, it's, mm -hmm. I'm still working on that. Yeah, that, that makes me vulnerable to the to the rebellion. You you exactly. will also be questioned. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, and I don't want to be, I don't want to breed rebellion, but I don't want to also be sycophants. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a and you know I'm trying to hold a fine tension. Um, mm -hmm. That's like the when problem. you start losing to them in a game that you taught them. It's <laughs> it's humbling, like you said. It yeah. is humbling. If they start asking me every single time, I have to ask them to go to bed. Daddy, why are you asking them to go to bed? I'm breathing rebellion. Mm -hmm. yet I, just, I need them to understand that they need to go to bed because it's, it's good for their health. Yeah, until they come back to you with the, well, I'm feeling my body and my body does not <laughs> need body. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that, I know that is coming when they become teenagers. They are still toddlers, so mm -hmm. I know it's coming. I yeah. have to be to prepare myself for that. Exactly. Yeah. So switching a little bit to this idea of gestalt. I mean, it sounds like it was at your dinner table, breakfast table for a mm -hmm. while. Mm -hmm. When would you say that you connected with it? It was when I did the IGO program. It was the International Gestalt and Organization Development Program. I did it in the, in, I think it was five or six years ago, 2018, 2017, 2018. Um, and I was in, I think it was in Milan. We, this was module three when we had started working on site visits with clients. They gave us opportunity to um, work with external clients. And I was with my colleagues and I was like, wow. If I can get this right, I can support these organizations to become aware of how they can move from being stuck to be more functional with options. Um, because in the work that we were doing with them, they felt stuck. The, the, the primary figure um, or the feeling of, the, of that organization was that we were felt, they felt stuck. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I could see all these possibilities that somehow they couldn't. Um, and I recognized, wow, actually, I only can see it because I've been in this guest out program uh, and they're teaching me to see how to name uh, figures, how to see the background and the foreground and so on and so on. And all these technologies and uh, theories and systems and understandings that enabled me to see things and appreciate things differently. They didn't have that orientation. So that was when it landed for me. I think it was in Milan with module three in the IGO program. And since then, um, I've I'm, I've been a big lover. Because when I began, it was all too new. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first two modules, I was like, wow, this is nice. And yet, oh my God, this is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, in module three, it really, I think the pain dropped. Um, mm -hmm. and, got, and I finally got, I'm like, aha, I think I get it now. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. what do you do with Gestalt? What is your practice? What is your work? My my life and work is to enable organizations. And that's one person system, individuals, you know, teams, whatever, uh, to become aware of what they want to do and find energy, resources, and purpose to do it without um, shame, without diminishing others, and opening up the space to 
meet the divine in others, to provide services, to provide everything they do is to meet a need. Let that need be something that connects with more meaningful purpose than just, you know, being paid. Uh, because being paid is easy, but finding meaning and purpose in life goes beyond that. And that's my lifelong work. I, I struggle with sometimes this idea of organizational development if it's just about better marketing and more selling and being a better capitalist. I am glad to hear that that's not what your work is about. It, it, you know, um, it, it's been... That's the difficulty in the gestalt world, perhaps even in the OD world, to sell this idea sufficiently. Mm -hmm. um, because it's such a, a new field, uh, the, the founders and the gurus in this, in, this, in this world, I think they have a responsibility to communicate this idea a little more than, it's, than it already is. They've written books, but I don't think it's sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, they need to get more, and I believe some of this, uh, and so thank you for putting this Humans of the Stout together, because some of this kind of things help to put the word out a little more, because reading and writing um, doesn't go as far as in our current world, particularly for those who need it most, um, like it would be for social media, mm -hmm. uh, and other forms of media. Uh, so I think it's it's important to share what Gestalt is and how it supports um, beyond capitalism uh, to enabling systems to function uh, and to, to do these wonderful things that we, we espouse, these wonderful values that we, we pronounce, uh, profess to, uh, to, to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it, yes, I think we have a lot of work to do in making our work known um, around the world. Mm -hmm. Our own marketing is definitely behind other other areas. It is, but it, but, but it's I'm... not an easy sell because it is complex. It is it's selling a whole system of thought of understanding of interconnection. It's not a simple phase one, phase two, do this, do that model. Yeah. Yes and no. Um, I, I, when I think about some of the basic core principles of Gestalt. It's so simple, and yet we make it so complex. So if I think of um, paradoxical theory of change as one way of being, it's, it's something that already exists. If I want to change, if, you, if I want to embody change, I first have to accept what is. Isn't that what economic anonymous people do? Before they engage you, they ask you to, I'm an alcoholic and I don't like it. That's, that's accepting what is. Mm -hmm. So some of these principles and a lot of the Gestalt principles come from other fields of psychology, of, of other fields, and it's embodied in this field. So yes, it is complex, and yet I think we can simplify it and it can be made simple in a way that can make others more attracted to this body of work and this body of knowledge that can then support leaders and support others to function and live life differently. I think it has changed my life completely mm -hmm. in how I appreciate things. And it will be so helpful. I'll be so grateful if everybody uh, could have some gestalt orientation because it helps you to, to not go into autopilot and to do the normal things you would do, but to interrogate a little more what is going on here? What is happening here? How do I make sense of this? What am I aware of? How do I form figures? What mm -hmm. is important to me? How do I energize myself to make changes um, and to get into contact with the other or even with myself. Um, because people don't have enough awareness of this, they just lash out and do things because they think it's right. And they, they find you find that their impact uh, is it's not pleasant. Mm -hmm. So how do you experience Gestalt community? If you do feel like you have one, if you are part of one, <clears throat> I am proud. Uh, I, I, I immediately find myself, I immediately find myself smiling um, when he said Gestalt community. I am incredibly proud of the Gestalt Africa community and the international community as well. 
they are full of wonderful. I'm, uh, I'm beaming. My heart is full just thinking about them. Uh, from Chantel to my dad to Jeremy to Michael, um, Marianne, Jono, all these wonderful people who have, um, if you will, been the sowers of the Gestalt seed all across uh, the world and doing wonderful work all over. Um, I'm proud, I'm excited for the possibilities of the things that they are trying to do in bringing the stout closer to, um, to communities, to the people, work that people do um, in a way that is transformative, in a way that shapes um, how people jointly find their way in what they want to do whether it's in oil organizations, oil companies, or in uh, the woman in the streets uh, trying to sell uh, something to make ends meet for her family. I believe that the start has a place in all of it. And so I'm incredibly proud, proud of them. The, we are doing the Gestalt African Leadership Program currently, uh, and uh, I'm beaming uh, because all these wonderful leaders who are coming from Af the African continent are coming from all kinds of uh, organizations, government, private, um, intergovernmental, and, and all of them have such wonderful uh, presence and things to share. And it's my hope and joy that this community grows bigger, um, that the knowledge of the start uh, expands and that people become more aware of how better um, they can live their lives with more awareness of self and others. Hmm. That, I mean, that sounds lovely. I'm looking forward to meeting a lot of these emerging mm. leaders and different mm. places. Mm. Do you feel accepted? Do you feel welcomed? Do you feel heard? Yes, in these communities, I feel heard. Um, but but um, there are two parts to this for me. In the work that I do, when I'm known, um, I'm heard and felt, and I feel heard and supported. However, uh, there's still the issue for me around ageism. And I'm 41 in a, in a continent where age plays a big issue on wisdom. Mm -hmm. So the older you are, the more wise you're supposed to be or uh, uh, expected to be. And so I get into certain, I'm invited and enabled to be, be in certain places only because my father is there. But when he's not, I'm not invited. Oh, so uh, you're still a teenager. I'm still a teenager. <laughs> exactly. So mm -hmm. I'm 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 walking in his steps um sufficiently till I'm perhaps in my 50s when I can walk into those spaces. When this starts own. getting a little more gray. Yeah, when I get some more gray and I, you know, have a perhaps I don't know, maybe I should grow a beard. I don't know. Um, who knows? But something about uh being heard a little less because I'm not as old as I should be. Uh, even though I have the same competency and knowledge, uh, perhaps mm -hmm. there's something about years of experience that matter uh, to some of these organizations, particularly for those in the regional and continental level. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk about ECOWAS and AU and you know all these other big, big organizations uh, on the continent, they tend to value age uh, mm -hmm. and years of experience. Uh, and something about trust plays into that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something about, because you're doing delicate work with these kinds of organizations. Uh, they have to bear themselves to you for them to, if you will, be their doctor um, mm -hmm. to them and to support them to find their own diagnosis, I guess. And it's shaming for, for them to perhaps do that with somebody so young. Mm -hmm. But I'm in the in you know in the African continent, I'm not youth anymore, because the youth is 25 to 35, mm -hmm. uh, which is the biggest uh, demographic, and I'm 41, so I'm way beyond the youth demographic now. But well, but that's it's a fine line. It's the same in Mexico. The demographic pyramid is you know yeah. few elders, many young, but yeah. it's. I mean, sometimes I see in the Western and the European and the North American models, you know, the older people are holding power 
sometimes beyond their relevance because like we were saying i mean they've been they've been leading from a model that does not correspond to the world that the people are currently living in it's not to say that older people are obsolete i mean i absolutely love and adore and value but it, it's a it's a fine line it's you know those those 18 year olds yeah. can also be tremendously valuable leaders but if you have to wait until you're 50 to have a voice that that's a it, bit much it's a problem mm -hmm. i think i think it's problematic and, and, and i think it comes back to what you said about sharing power i mean it's yeah. great if they'll listen to your father in his 70s but he lets you in the room yeah. that's probably ideal now you bring your son you bring exactly. your <laughs> exactly exactly Heather. so i think that that's where we need to start moving towards how do we enable the youth to have a voice um, in in the conversations that we are having. After all, we have something to learn from them. So it, it's, it, and I share in your sentiment in that it's a power issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the responsibility is what my father is trying to take up now, where he's opening the door for me. Mm -hmm. and now I have the responsibility then to open the next door when mm -hmm. I get it through for the next person and so on and so forth. Uh, and so if every other person is opening the door for the other, Mm -hmm. The conversation becomes richer. Mm -hmm. Diversity is is beautiful. Diversity of ideas, diversity of opinions, enriches. It doesn't diminish. Right. Um, and in any natural ecosystem, you find diversity. It's only uh, a monoculture. It's a human made uh, uh, invention. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm just thinking, you know, maybe symbolically, maybe literally, it'd be interesting if while well, you're over here doing your work, you know. What if your kids go into those spaces that their grandfather can hold? And it will be skip you entirely. <laughs> it, it, it will be so wonderful, wouldn't it? I mean, I, I welcome the opportunity, right? To have, you know, these multi-generational conversations. Mm -hmm. and, and yet that's I don't find that that happens sufficiently, particularly in the governance structures, in the governance mm -hmm. systems. And in my context, it's happening less and less. There's a big divide between the political elite who are 70 and above and sometimes even 80 and above and the and the you know, you know the 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 ruling the who are being governed um, mm -hmm. yeah this by... sense of trajectory of i've earned this and now yeah. you have to earn it it's like well I maybe i it. maybe i don't need 50 years to no i don't need i don't need to be 50 to mm -hmm. have my voice in the room how how about you bring me on and i share so much of my experiences that can make you even better Right, so we learn from each other. There's something, mm -hmm. there's something to be said about this sharing that is not happening enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just thinking it, it cut and paste to academia. Listen to me because I have a PhD. Well, if this PhD invites someone from their undergraduate program, it's the same value. The same value, and we need to have this. You know, there needs to be an up. We need to turn it around and, and make it different than it is. And I think part of our work, um, and I'm including you in this, um, in the wonderful work you're doing of putting this humans of Gestalt um, piece out, is to invite these conversations to happen sufficiently. How do we turn this around to have this cross-generational, cross-section of conversations to open the doors for others to come through? I mean, I remember when I saw my father's interview on the Humans of Gestalt some years back, and I wondered, wow, when am I ever going to get the opportunity? Here I am. Mm -hmm. So this, these doors don't have to be shut for those who, who could possibly come on. Mm -hmm. If we open the opportunities for them, the, you know, more opportunities um, emerge as a result. The richer mm -hmm. the conversation, the more options we have, the better mm -hmm. we become. It, it's been a very interesting process getting to you and getting to a lot of the people that I interview now, because it depends on the awareness of the people that I'm speaking to. I'll say, yeah. you know, can you think of anyone who I should contact to be interviewed? Yeah. And it's yeah. fascinating to see who gets recommended and who gets forgotten. And, yeah. and the way that it's that that focus, that that microphone gets passed yeah. up. Yeah. In yeah. in age, in wisdom, <laughs> until I end up at an old white man, and it's like, how did I get here again? <laughs> it's like, yeah. but 
but it it's so real it's it it's seems true. like a joke it seems like a simplification yeah. yeah but it takes a lot of intention to it, open that perspective more absolutely. and it, I, I'm, I feel like i'm holding the doors of an elevator open i'm like no and it's it's the tendency is that it will close and i don't want that to happen absolutely and i think that's what we need to do is that and i don't know if it's going to happen in our lifetime but we need to continue to keep the door open and keep pushing and keep raising the awareness of how do we make the door wider for others to come in and it, it doesn't have to take i don't think it takes away from any of us if we have more people in mm -hmm. i agree i absolutely agree yeah yeah, and people are like, when's the project done? I'm like, I don't think we've met everybody yet, so I don't think it's done. <laughs> no, it's not done. Yeah. There's, there's more opportunity. There's more, there's other perspectives that could be enriching. Yeah. Um, and we don't, uh, the diversity of it is what I'm looking forward to, mm -hmm. as opposed to this person dropped this wisdom and then that's it. Mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing left. The yeah. Dalai Lama has spoken and then, <laughs> and the Dalai Lama laughs at himself too. I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, do you have any final thoughts you would like to add? Yes. Um, I am excited about the possibility of Gestalt becoming on our continent more prevalent than it has been because, um, through the work that we are offering in it's a platform. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to say this here. There are other um, people who are interested in learning about Gestalt, who want to speak or do Gestalt things. Uh, and I think we have a responsibility. I think that the responsibility falls on us now uh, through this platform to perhaps be the ones who hold the platform and but not necessarily have to be on the platform. So we hold a platform and say, hey, this is what is happening. This is a platform you can come and share, you can come and learn, you can come and do something um, about the start. Mm -hmm. And instead of keeping it as a closed net, you know, cult of, you know, wise gestalt people, I don't think that's helpful. The more people get into the start, the better we all can be. Yeah. And I welcome that opportunity that that is what this this and other platforms are enabling us uh, to do. So I, I really hope that we can bring more people on board and have yeah. have you scheduled, have more Gestalt, uh, humans of Gestalt every day. So that you, your calendar is completely full <laughs> uh, with people who could, you don't have any time for any other thing than to interview more Gestalt, Gestalt okay. folks. I welcome that opportunity. Me too. I feel very invited. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just dealing with my own challenges of how to stay awake from one o'clock to nine o'clock ah. <laughs> to learn from you. But um, now I feel like Australians, it's it's karma. Every time I've scheduled an event and there's been like one Australian alone in the dark, that's me now. So the time zone thing is difficult. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah, we'll, we'll mean, get over how, these, these physical limitations and find exactly. out. Exactly. I mean, look at how long it took us to to finally meet. Mm -hmm. it's, it's challenging, yeah. but but it can be done. It can be done. So. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. here we are. And thank you. If it's okay for you, I will leave this one here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.